Okay, if they're so smart, tell me how come they haven't figured this one out. They say all the chemicals that we have today evolved by fusion in the stars. Problem, the stars are made out of the chemical elements. So which one evolved first? The elements to make the stars or the stars to make the elements? you got a chicken and an egg problem going on here. They're saying, oh, well, oh, we did, uh, the, the chemicals just evolved from the stars. But the stars are made out of the chemicals. They're made out of the elements. You, you, it's, it, it's a dead end from, from the word go. This is literally the dumbest thing that I have ever heard a creationist say. You would think that if your goal was to bring down science, which is obviously something that Eric Hoven would love to do, you would take some time to actually learn something about it. Eric's remarks reveal a previously unimaginable level of ignorance of basic science. First, he says that astronomers think that every single element on the periodic table came from fusion in stars. Well, 91% of the atoms in the universe are hydrogen atoms, and none of these form by fusion in stars because hydrogen is the lightest element. 8.9% of the atoms in the universe are helium-4 atoms, which can be made in stars by fusion of four protons. However, only 10% of the helium-4 atoms could have been made by fusion in stars. We know this because we can calculate the energy that would have been released and turned into starlight if all of the helium-4 atoms in the universe originated by fusion of four protons and compare that to the amount of starlight there actually is. The next three elements on the periodic table are lithium, beryllium, and boron. These elements have very fragile nuclei that are easily destroyed at the high temperatures needed for fusion. Consequently, in order to explain their present cosmic abundances, some process that takes place outside of stars is required. The elements heavier than roughly iron are virtually impossible to make by fusion. There are two reasons for this. Fusion of elements heavier than iron absorbs energy instead of releasing it. And so, this is a thermodynamically unfavorable process. Also, since elements heavier than iron have lots of protons in their nuclei, their nuclei would have a large positive charge and thus repel each other so much that the temperature would have to be unrealistically high for fusion to happen. The next ridiculous thing that Eric says is that astronomers have a chicken and egg paradox when it comes to elements and stars. Which came first, he asks, the stars that made the elements or the elements that made the stars? Well, we've already seen that fusion in stars cannot account for most of the elements on the periodic table, so there must be other processes that can create elements. If these processes were operating before the first stars formed, then they would have produced the atoms that the first stars formed from. Indeed, this is exactly what happened, and why there is no chicken and egg paradox when it comes to elements in stars. The process responsible for creating the first atoms in the universe is called Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. According to the Big Bang Theory, the universe started in a very hot and dense state. The universe has been expanding ever since its beginning, and this expansion causes the temperature and density to decrease with time. So the farther back in time we look, the higher the temperature and density. Let's follow the history of matter from shortly after the Big Bang to the present. Neutrons and protons are made out of tinier particles called quarks and gluons. At temperatures above 2 trillion Kelvin, the quarks and gluons behave as free particles and are unable to combine into more complex structures. We call such a state of matter a quark-gluon plasma. When the temperature dropped below 2 trillion Kelvin, 24.1 microseconds after the Big Bang, the quarks and gluons combined into protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are collectively called nucleons. At first, the protons and neutrons were in chemical equilibrium with each other. This means that protons and neutrons were turning into each other at such a high rate that the fraction of nucleons that were protons and the fraction that were neutrons was entirely determined by the temperature. Because neutrons have a slightly higher mass than protons, there will always be more protons than neutrons in chemical equilibrium. The lower the temperature, the higher will be the fraction of nucleons that are protons. When neutrons and protons first came into existence, the temperature was so high that approximately half of the nucleons were neutrons and half were protons. But by one second after the Big Bang, only 17% of nucleons were neutrons. At this time in the history of the universe, the temperature and density were so high that particles called neutrinos were present in copious amounts. Neutrinos have very low mass and no electric charge, and they can only interact via the weak force. There are three kinds of neutrinos, called electron, muon, and tau neutrinos, 
and their corresponding antineutrinos. Also present at this time were electrons and their antiparticle partner positrons. Positrons have the same mass as electrons, but they have a positive electric charge. It was the electrons, positrons, and neutrinos that allowed protons and neutrons to turn into each other and thus to be in chemical equilibrium. For example, a collision between a proton and an electron could turn the proton into a neutron and the electron into an electron neutrino. A collision between a proton and an anti-electron neutrino could turn the proton into a neutron and the anti-electron neutrino into a positron. Similarly, neutrons could turn into protons by colliding with positrons or electron neutrinos. Isolated neutrons can also spontaneously decay into protons. The rate at which protons and neutrons turned into each other depended on the rate at which they collided with electrons, positrons, and neutrinos. This collision rate, in turn, depends on the density and temperature. In general, the collision rate is higher at higher temperatures and densities. So, as the universe expanded and the temperature and density dropped, the collision rates would decrease. Eventually, the collision rates would drop below the expansion rate of the universe, and after this time, the collision rate can be approximated as zero. The collision rate between neutrinos and nucleons dropped below the cosmic expansion rate 0.328 seconds after the Big Bang. We call this event decoupling of neutrinos. After this time, neutrons and protons could still turn into each other by collisions with electrons and positrons. But the collision rate with these particles dropped below the expansion rate after 1.15 seconds after the Big Bang. After this time, the fraction of nucleons that are neutrons would have remained at 17% forever if it wasn't for the fact that neutrons could decay into protons. Because of this decay, the neutron fraction slowly decreased after this time. This event is called proton-neutron freeze-out. Until 4.12 seconds after the Big Bang, the temperature was so high that the average thermal energy per particle exceeded the rest mass energy of electrons and positrons. That is, the thermal energy per particle exceeded E equals mc squared, where m is the mass of an electron. Consequently, electron-positron pairs were constantly being created. Once created, the electrons and positrons would eventually find their antiparticle partner and annihilate back into thermal energy. After 4.12 seconds after the Big Bang, there wasn't enough thermal energy to create new electron-positron pairs. All of the positrons that were created at earlier times found an electron to annihilate with. However, there were about 1 billion and 1 electrons for every 1 billion positrons. So after all of the positrons had annihilated, there were some electrons left over. This event is called electron-positron annihilation. At this time, the temperature was too high for protons and neutrons to stick together into atomic nuclei. But by 366 seconds after the Big Bang, the temperature dropped to 697 million Kelvin, and protons and neutrons could collide and combine into deuterium. Deuterium is the name given to the hydrogen isotope, H2, which has one neutron and one proton. At this time, the fraction of nucleons that were neutrons had dropped to 12% due to neutrons decaying into protons. This meant that there was only one neutron for every seven protons. So six out of every seven protons would not be able to find a neutron to fuse with and would ultimately become hydrogen one nuclei. This explains why most of the atoms in the universe today are hydrogen atoms. As a side note, proton-proton collisions during Big Bang nucleosynthesis did not lead to fusion. This is because a bound state of two protons is unstable. It is possible for one of the protons to decay into a neutron so that a stable deuterium nuclei results from the fusion of two protons. However, this has to happen before the two protons fly apart. And the probability that such a decay will happen in the time the two protons spin close together is negligible. Similarly, neutron-neutron collisions don't lead to fusion. Once deuterium formed, it was possible to make heavier elements by fusion. Helium-3 could be made by colliding a deuterium nucleus and a proton, or by colliding two deuterium nuclei. Tritium could be made by colliding two deuterium nuclei. Helium-4 was made by collisions between tritium and deuterium, or between helium-3 and deuterium. Lithium-7 was formed during collisions between tritium and helium-4, and finally beryllium-7 was made during collisions between helium-3 and helium-4. Twenty minutes after the Big Bang, the temperature and density dropped so much that the nuclear reaction rates dropped to zero and Big Bang nucleosynthesis was over. Big Bang nucleosynthesis ended before elements heavier than beryllium-7 could be made. Tritium, 
which is the isotope of hydrogen with two neutrons, also called hydrogen-3, is unstable, and any tritium made would eventually decay into helium-3. Similarly, the beryllium-7 produced during Big Bang nucleosynthesis decayed into lithium-7. The end result is that Big Bang nucleosynthesis created five isotopes, hydrogen-1, hydrogen-2, helium-3, helium-4, and lithium-7. How do astronomers know that the Big Bang actually produced these isotopes via the above-mentioned processes? Because they can calculate the amount of each isotope that would have been made during Big Bang nucleosynthesis and compare the results to the observed primordial abundances of these isotopes. The results of a recent calculation and recent observations are shown on the screen. The abundances predicted by the Big Bang theory match the observations within observational error for deuterium, helium-3, and helium-4. The Big Bang Theory predicts three times as much lithium-7 as observed, but at least it predicts the correct order of magnitude. That is, the Big Bang predicts that the primordial lithium-7 abundance will be something times 10 to the negative 10, and observations show that it is something times 10 to the negative 10. It's important to appreciate how truly remarkable the comparison to Big Bang nucleosynthesis predictions to observations really is. We have correctly deduced the outcome of a process that lasted less than 20 minutes and took place almost 14 billion years ago. So the Big Bang produced hydrogen, helium, and lithium. But where did all of the other elements come from? Well, that's where stars come into the narrative, and I'll leave that for a later video.